Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda, and I've just submitted my PhD thesis in the epigenetics group. And today I'll be talking to you about this concept that there is so much DNA inside our tiny cells. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> so each of the trillions of cells in our body contains a copy of our DNA sequence. And this sequence contains the full set of human genes. But not every cell uses every single gene. For example, there are certain genes that you need to make your heart beat. So these will be switched on in your heart cells, but switched off in every other cell type. So it's the pattern of the genes that are turned on and off that give each cell its function. So I've represented the genome here as being comprised of four genes, A to D, but in reality, there's actually 22,000 genes in the genome. That means that each copy of DNA is huge, and as my title suggests, it's two meters. But somehow, it fits within this tiny control center of the cell called the nucleus, which is 50 times smaller than a grain of salt. Um, so, in order to achieve this, the DNA has to be very efficiently packaged. And as Sue pointed out, that first step is to wrap it around these proteins called histones to form this bead on a string, bead on a string structure. And this is how the DNA always exists in the cell. But just for simplicity in my future slides, I'll be representing this structure with a straight line. So to package so much DNA into the cell, it needs to be very extensively compacted by being looped and coiled over and over again. So that means that within the cell, our genome actually has a complex three-dimensional structure. It's exactly like a ball of wool. If you were to unravel it, it would just be one single line. But if you were to bundle it up again, it'd be this mound of complicated interweaving threads. So current research has actually shown us and refined our understanding of how that DNA is actually looped within the cell. So previously, like my slide before, it seemed that maybe it was just generally kind of all mingling together. But now we know that this mingling is actually occurring in these um, separated hubs. So what's happening is that in each, hub, in each hub, the DNA is making contacts with the DNA within the hub, but not between it. And it's really important for DNA to be able to make these loops because, as Sue said, along with containing our genes, our um, DNA also contains elements that act as on and off switches. So these on and off switches sit on those histone tails that Sue introduced earlier. And they work by making physical contact with the genes. So if DNA is linear, no contacts can be made. But we know that it's looped within the cell and it can give rise to structures such as this. So here we see that on switch coming into contact with gene A and switching its expression on, but not coming into contact with gene B. There's a variety of structures that can arise um, from the same DNA. So here we have another structure that could um, occur where the on switch completely skips over gene A and instead turns on gene B. So the ability of the cell to make these various structures is essential because DNA is very much like origami. In origami, we start with a single sheet of paper um, and it begins with the potential to become any shape and it's only by folding it in a precise way that it is given a specific identity. Every cell in our body contains an exact copy of our DNA, but it can be looped in specific ways, which put these genes into contact with different switches, meaning that in different cells there will be different genes on and off, which gives the cells a specific function. So the DNA in our brain cells will be folded differently to the DNA in our heart cells. Now, that means that it's really important that the right loops are in place, and part of the way that we, the cell achieves this is by having barriers between these looping hubs. So at this point in time, we don't actually know uh, what barriers are comprised of, but what we're starting to see is that in disease, they can be lost. And this is because when we visualize the 3D disease genome, we see that um, you get these new loops and these new contacts occurring between the hubs, which shouldn't be there. And a research group in Berlin made a very um, interesting uh, sorry, had a very uh, striking discovery that showed that DNA barrier loss can actually give rise to limb malformation. So for a normal hand to develop, um, you need to have this structure of DNA where you have these three separate <coughs> looping hubs, and then in each of those is a developmental gene, ABC. Um, but in brachydactyly, uh, which is abnormal shortening of the fingers, 
what the researchers show that in early development there is a deletion of this boundary which actually fuses these two hubs together, meaning that the gene B and C are now contacting incorrect on and off switches, giving rise to this malformation. F syndrome is another example. So this is where you have abnormal segmentation of the hand, and it often uh, results in a fusing of the forefinger and thumb. And in this um, syndrome, what they found was that in early development, there is an inversion of this part of DNA. So it becomes completely flipped around. So what this means is that even though the barrier is still in place, these gene A and B have been placed in a completely incorrect context, once again accessing the wrong switches, giving rise to the malformation. So these hubs aren't just important in development. In our lab, we work in prostate cancer, and we made the very exciting finding that generally in normal prostate cells, um, we, have a, we have the healthy setup of the hubs, but then in prostate cancer, what we find is that these actually become broken into multiples, and these multiples um, create new barriers. So what's really interesting is that genes that change um, expression in prostate cancer are found at these new looping <coughs> interactions. So my work in particular, I was trying to understand what makes a barrier. So if we can understand what makes a healthy barrier, then we can understand how it becomes um, how it becomes disrupted in disease. So as I explained earlier, the barriers are not simple. They're not just one protein. They're made up of multiple and I've kind of represented that with my rainbow wall here. So what I did is I deleted the protein that was suggested by a lot of research to be the essential protein to hold the structures together. Um, and what I predicted would happen would be that I would lose these boundaries um, because I've lost that essential protein. But what I actually found was that the hubs seem to remain generally intact. So what this tells us is that we haven't even scratched the surface on understanding how these hubs are created and maintained. So today I hope I've, I've shown you how the 3D structure of the genome is an epigenetic layer that controls whether genes are on or off in the cell. Um, I showed a couple of examples, but our 3D maps of healthy and diseased genomes are far from complete which means we really need to keep researching in this space. Thank you.